Good, good morning. Uh, this is Mark Wilson with AccuDoc, and I am very happy to have today Miss uh, Stacy Applebaum from Niska Una High School up in Albany, New York. Uh, Niska Una, New York. Niska Una, New York. Okay, so Niska Una, New York, which is just outside of Albany, up there on the up uh, up on the upper parts of New York State. So, welcome, Stacy. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Mark. It's great to be here. Awesome. So we talked with Stacy earlier in the summer and Niski Una High School under Stacy's tutelage had been really gone kind of, I'm going to say out of the box uh, for rowing practices. They were doing a little bit of everything, trying to keep the kids uh, very active and engaged in not only rowing, but just physical fitness. Is that right, Stacy? It is. It is. We really expanded what we were doing in terms of land training uh, to broaden their horizons a little bit, but also to introduce them to some lifetime fitness activities that they could continue on their own. You were, you brought, you kept them on the water in kayaks, right? Canoes? We did. We, did. we had kayaks. Um, so our, our we, because of, of uh, the limitations of equipment, we had to divide into groups. Everybody rode three days a week and did <clears throat> fitness training two days. And so part of those fitness things were kayaking, running, cycling, hiking, um, exploring the town through a scavenger hunt, all kinds of things like that. that. That sounded really good. And I'm guessing it probably helped in their physical fitness as they came back into the uh, academic year and school and, and then your you know, quote unquote normal uh, season, which of course nobody has had a, a normal season. Right. But how did that transition go between the summer programs that you and your fellow coaches uh, established into your more regular time frame? I, I'll I'll give it that. Um, it very well actually. We took two weeks off at the end of August, started up again the week before Labor Day, and which was really nice because the kids hadn't started school yet. So we had a little more flexibility with time. Everybody was able to row every day uh, for that 10 day period until school started. And then we got back into the rowing three days a week, cross training two days a week with our, our middle school program, our varsity boys and varsity girls. And Excellent. We maintained that, that kind of a, a schedule until just about two, three weeks ago, we introduced quads. So we had been in all singles and doubles until uh, just about two weeks ago. And we had based the criteria on uh, our singles and doubles had gone so well over the summer. We'd had no exposure, no positive test cases within the team. Kids were great. Uh, my concern was when school started and we, our pot of kids mixed in with a larger population. So. I said, we're gonna go at least three weeks of school before we expand into bigger boats and see how it goes. And there, things were going very well at school, very well at the boathouse. Uh, we sent out permission slips. And I would say about 60% of our parents allowed their kids to row in quads. Excellent. And that's a big thing because every family is a, has got a little different situation um, with either uh, younger siblings or older parents or grandparents or people with it, with risk, um, you know, underlying health issues or so on. So everybody has different reasons for putting, for signing those waivers or allowing their kids to expand their, um, their um, pod, as you said. So. Exactly. And so we've been great. It's, it has allowed us now to row four days a week and so one cross training day has been given to rowing since we now have enough seats for all the varsity boys and girls when we can include those quads so that has helped us tremendously to add another day of rowing that's great how how has the kids um and maybe the coaches as well how has their attitude been at the boathouse like just being able to to row or being able to be with their teammates? Has it been generally positive? Very positive. The kids are thrilled to be there, uh, to get out of the house, get out of school. We have about uh, 
10% of our kids are totally remote learning. And so for them, this is it. This is the only time they get out. Uh, for the others, they are in school every other day. So getting out, getting down to the boathouse, seeing friends, doing things has been a huge uh, mental relief for them, I think. As well as a physical outlet, it's been a mental and emotional outlet. I think that comment is extremely um, important. And the, we've had several of these kind of discussions with other um, types of teams, collegiate teams and master's teams. And the mental aspect of our sport or mental aspect of physical fitness in general is really, really important. And I think everybody has been realizing that that portion of the individual's well-being really is a valuable piece to be aware of and to nurture. So what you're sharing is exactly the same as other folks have been seeing as well. And something that maybe in the past we've neglected or taken a little bit as a under underappreciated portion of, of the athletes. So that's great. Totally. You know, to me, one of the things that really stuck out as a surprising factor was that we closed our locker rooms. Uh, they're very small spaces and, and so they're just totally closed. But the kids really missed that 10, 15 minute, you know, that transition time, the bonding, the inside jokes, all of that. I didn't realize how big a role it played in, in their daily lives. So. Yeah, I've been talking with other coaches and that, you know, the, the collegiate, the collegiate athlete who might normally go off and have breakfast or, you know, something like that, where high school kids, they typically just, you know, go home to their families and do their homework or whatnot. But that time, that specific time that you just mentioned in the locker room or changing time or whatever is, is valuable. And that, especially in rowing where we don't have, you know, the, the talking in the boat is always kind of a foreboding thing. And so the, the interaction inside of practice is very limited um, from, a, from an interaction standpoint. So these little times before and after practice are pretty interesting. Is, are you developing time? Are you developing part of, uh, you know, maybe a warm up period or something where they can have a little more activity or free time? We have, uh, they get a half hour of transition time when they arrive at the boathouse. Um, and they, some kids use that to play football. We've got a four square court that they play on. Um, some people just hang out in the trailer, uh, but that is their social time. Nice. Is that before practice. And what's fascinating is I find they're showing up earlier and earlier. Uh -huh. <laughs> so they get more and more of that time. Uh, That's nice. Really nice, yeah. So it's good. We have developed it in there. But you're right. It's funny. We're out in groups to row, but there isn't really much social interaction once you're in that boat. Um, it's, it's all focused on work. Although I will say I had four quads out yesterday and they were yucking it up and just having so much fun. It was great to see them with so much sort of enthusiasm and energy it sort of looked like an old time regular practice. Just Excellent. The that, whole team sat together and it was a lot of fun. That's great to hear. Well, it is nice to know that people are rowing in a little bit bigger, bigger boats and safe conditions and doing mm -hmm. well and, and uh, you know, continuing. So that, that's excellent. We are. We're progressing, as they say. Yeah. Um, and so, our, land, our land training has also been good. We did. We continued with some of the, the themes from the summer with the kayaking and the cycling and, and the running, but we've added things like we rode our bikes to the apple orchard and picked apples and uh, had someone drove a car and we filled the car with all the bags of apples and rode back to the boathouse. Um, we ran to the town park and played kickball, um, had an obstacle course. Uh, we've allowed the kids to create some of the land workouts. And it's fascinating because they're always much tougher than the things we come up with. <laughs> right. That's good. Those are all such good things. And again, it's about being outside, being athletic and, and mm -hmm. interacting with each other in a, in, in a fun way. So yeah. that's great. 
So with all of this great activity, um, I also understand that maybe you actually had a chance to have a competition, which is pretty crazy right now. So how, how did the, A, how did the competition go? And then how did you feel the, all of the work and effort that your athletes and you as, and the coaches have put in, how did, how did you feel like it worked out? Well, first off, it was such a great feeling to load the trailer and go somewhere different. I think for the kids, just getting to a new place uh, was wonderful. We uh, live very close to Saratoga rowing, and we went up there to scrimmage with them. They do their head of the fish course every Saturday. And so we joined in their, their head race, which was a great opportunity for us. And... Uh, they're very fast, um, sort of in our league, Saratoga is the top and, and, and we're ranked second. So it was a, a great challenge for us to go up and, and test ourselves if what we have been doing is working. And most of our fall, more of our emphasis has been on technical rowing, uh, you know, getting very um, proficient in a single, being able to work hard and lots of long aerobic work has been our big focus. And then some fun sprinting things thrown in just to keep their interest. <laughs> and so uh, it, the setup was perfect. Saratoga launched out of their boathouse. And anyone who's ever been to the Head of the Fish or Saratoga Invitational in New York State, everyone else boats out of the state uh, boat launch. So they floated a dock over for us to the state boat launch. So we had our trailer and our kids and our parents we're the only ones there. Perfect. And we didn't have any intermingling with the two teams except in boats on the water, which was great. So from a safety perspective, it was terrific. Um, the kids got out, it was good to remember what racing was like. It had literally been a year since we'd raced and that was where we last raced. So it was a great event to go out for. Um, and we did well, we were, um, the kids we expected to be competitive really were. Um, you know, our middle of the group hung in there. And so it, for us, it was really a great reinforcement that we were doing the right thing. You know, we've got some speed going, which is good, but the time spent on technique and just building fitness has paid off and been very worthwhile. That's fantastic. What a, what a great way to kind of reopen reopen the season now I do understand that up there in New York unlike in Florida it's uh it's a little on the cool side today so your season of racing and maybe even practice is getting shorter and shorter yes days are numbered <laughs> yes so it's great to see the team uh have that opportunity it would be really an unfortunate shame to have to go through the entire entire summer or really the whole spring summer and fall without an, a chance to compete mm -hmm. let me let me ask you one one more question uh, well two more questions one is about your newer athletes the ones that you had developed over the summer and I remember you saying that you had a very good uh learn to row season mm -hmm. how did those kids kind of uh, mix in with the more experienced kids? And then how did you feel like they performed after kind of an odd uh, way to get started with the sport? Mm -hmm. Our summer learn to row kids uh, blended in seamlessly Excellent. with the kids. Uh, you know, the time uh, teaching learn to row all in singles was fabulous. We are fortunate enough to have the equipment that everybody could start in a wary, move up, to um, a uh, single with pontoons, then move into a pine art, and then move into a racing boat. So there was that nice gradual progression of increasing difficulty and skill level, which worked out really well for all of them. Uh, and the summer, we were so excited about how the summer went, we added learn to row sessions for the fall. And it was just three days a week for four weeks. Just come find out what it's like because all of the middle school sports were canceled in our district. And so there was nothing for them to do. So we brought in an interest and interested a new group of kids. And of those, 
I would say 70% asked to convert to join the team. Excellent. And, wow. Yeah. So by mid-October, they were coming every day with the middle school kids. And so, so your team, so your team has really seen a, a sounds like a phenomenal growth in during this closed period. Right. It, one of the things that has sort of surprised me, we expected based on the economy, based on costs, based on probably not racing, that we would lose 25 to 30 percent of our our athletes. And we didn't. Uh, we lost maybe five to 10 percent uh, and gained uh, 10 new kids, 10 to 15 yeah. new kids. So we were really happy with how our, our club has progressed. That's great. What is, um, this is a final question for the, for the morning here, but what's the, what is your prognosis or your prediction on what will happen really in, into the spring? We know New York is always a, a tough place to do winter training. You've got snow, you've got cold, you've got all of that. So that probably won't change too much. I know you're, you'll be inside, but doing your distancing part and stuff. No. Oh, no. okay. Uh, we're not allowed inside to be training inside at the high school. So uh, we are working on, we have uh, gotten permission to access a building in the town where we will store all of our equipment and we'll roll those ergs outside and oh. outside training when it's viable. Um, and when it's not, we'll be indoors. But we've already started collecting cross country skis snowshoes, uh, building weight bars with dumbbell, you know, with the coffee can, the old cement coffee can. <laughs> uh, we've got those going. And so the idea is that we'll try to be outside and training in, in a really positive way whenever we can. Okay. So that does, that, that sounds like old school right there. It is old school, old school. And I sort of, I honestly, I got it from my daughter's raced indoor track and the only thing they did indoors were the races all of their training was done outdoors all winter long um and and the, their coach the saying was there's no bad weather only bad clothing choices so ah. get dressed and go there and you that's go. sort of what we're trying to do this winter Okay. So then with that, then what are you, what are you thinking will happen? Or is there been any discussion? Is there a plan A, B, and C for the, for the spring? The spring, we're, we're prepared to keep running the model we've been running into the spring. I think that what will happen is we'll end up with a lot of dual races uh, where you just have two, maybe three teams come in, fewer of the big events. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure how that will work. I know New York State, we have a big championship. It's a two-day event. And we're looking at ways to reduce that to a one-day uh, so that people are only traveling within the state and no one's staying overnight anywhere. Okay. You know, it's interesting about the regattas versus the dual racing. I was talking with another uh, friend of mine about that and the fact that rowing has developed and grown so much in the last few years that these bigger and bigger regattas really are more of the norm mm -hmm. but back when i rode and a lot of other people rode it was all dual racing right. and it's really interesting because you think about a lot of other school sports you know there aren't any other you know when you go play a soccer game it's against another team when you go play basketball, it's against one other team and so on. You know, obviously track meets might be a little bit different and stuff, but usually the game is against another specific mm -hmm. team. So perhaps this will be something where we, again, kind of go backwards a little bit, but an opportunity to become more focused on your actual competition, you know, the actual team that you're competing against. Um, you know, when, when I was rowing, way back when we were, we, I was just counting it up this morning and I realized that we probably had eight to 10 races in the spring, but six of those were dual races. And so it was a real focus to know, okay, we're going to go race X team and try to win. 
not just go to participate in some big regatta somewhere and maybe be in the final. So um, a lot more, a lot more uh, specific emphasis on every every stroke being taken uh, when you know you're only racing one other team for six minutes. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. And I also, I think, especially for high school kids, the way regattas have grown, they take up so much time. time. Most yeah. of them now are two days. You're there. Um, you know, we call nobody works nine to five. We work five to nine. And on those regatta days, and they, they just kill you for the, the length of time that kids have to be there. Yeah. And I think this where we went up and raced at Saratoga, we arrived, unloaded, rigged, raced, de-rigged, loaded, and we're out of there in four hours. You know, we were done by noon and, and had yeah. the rest of the weekend feeling satisfied that we'd raced well and had a good experience and the kids could go off and do more with their lives. So I, I like the reintroduction of this dual racing. I think it's a healthier option for our kids and also frankly, a less expensive one. You know, sure. the entry fees, you know, we pay, gosh, you know, 15 to $20,000 a year just in entry fees. And that's huge, a huge budget on a program like ours. So if we could eliminate some of that by going back and racing teams that match us well, then it would help everybody. Yeah. Well, Stacy, once again, it's great to talk with you. These are wonderful things for everybody else to hear. I know we've been getting lots of good uh, feedback from our, from our little series here. And I know this episode specifically will be listened to and, and really everybody will end up feeling really good about it. So I appreciate all of your time again and, and everything that you do with your team and, and for the sport of rowing. It's fantastic. So. Well, thank you, Mark. We've enjoyed it. And I've loved listening to your other podcast and hearing what other people are doing and, and the impact on, on rowing in the larger community. So Excellent. thanks for your efforts too. You're welcome. It's, it is absolutely my pleasure. So yeah. I don't know if we'll see your team down in Florida this winter, but uh, hopefully another time, another another year. I hope so. I hope so. That was that's the last time they were on the water, you know, before we we got back this summer. So yeah, uh, that was a wonderful trip. We had a great time. So I know. Good. Kids go back if their parents would let them. <laughs> <laughs> another time. Another time. All right. All right. Well, thank you again very much and all the best to uh, everything that goes on and, and try to stay warm on those outdoor uh, erg sessions. The coaches, the coaching launch is always colder than the rowing shell. And I'm sure the, the standing around in the cold watching your kids work out in the snow will be uh, also chilly. So get it, wear your boots. You bet. You okay. Bet. Thanks so thank much. Thank you. Mark. Take care. Bye bye.